Okay, welcome back, uh, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes? Okay. Um, my name is Margot Brouwer, they, them, and I will be your chair for this session. It's the first uh, of two sessions on quantum information from gravity to unification. And the first speaker will be our keynote, Eric Verlinde. Eric barely needs any introduction because, well, He's well known and also he has been a keynote at all four of the Information Universe conferences. So he's almost part of the furniture here. <laughs> um, and I also know him well because I've worked uh, for, I think, like five years with, together with him to put his theories to astronomical tests. So I will be very curious to hear what he has to say during this talk, Emergent Gravity, a status report. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back here. Um, indeed, the topic will be again the same, basically emergent gravity. I, I, I gave the channel title just to, because I didn't really know yet what I would be saying, because I always find it a little bit of a challenge to speak in front of this general audience and many people from different sites. Uh, yesterday at the dinner, I had also conversations about just well, what are the ideas or even the pictures you think about when you start or well, thinking about news ways or thinking about gravity. Actually, I'll try to answer a little bit of, uh, of that in, in the talk as well. The other thing I wanted to do is actually talk a little more general about why I think emergence in general is a, a good way to think about physics. And this has a bit of a more of a philosophical way of thinking. And it actually connects directly, uh, as I'll make clear, to the main theme uh, of information. So here's a brief outline. I'm going to talk about emergence and information. This, as I said, is more of a philosophical perspective I have on how we think about science. We should think about science. Then I will go more into the details of emergent gravity. At least I review a little bit what is going on, the essential ideas and, and some recent developments. And then eventually we want to get to a more connection with observations, maybe in terms of looking first at the sitter space. And at the end, I want to talk about a model that I already presented actually last year on the, in the online, or two years ago in the online version, which is some ideas related to this Hubble tension. We had some talks about this before, and so I'll present this here because I also wanna have some feedback from the experts uh, here in this uh, room. So let me just start generally. I mean, emergence, I think many people know already what is emergence. I mean, it's just the idea that instead of having reductionist point of view, where everything can be derived from everything microscopic, like you go from atoms to molecules to, to life and things like this. You have this other idea that there might be things happening at larger scales or, or in complex systems, which cannot be simply derived from the uh, underlying uh, microscopic theory. And it's not like everything is determined from the small. Also, uh, there may be uh, things happening at larger scales that somehow connect back to the, the short distance scales. And I think one of the reasons why we think about emergence is also the fact that we as human beings are making up our theories from our brain and so on. And there's some way in which we should also realize there is a limitation to what we can do. This is indeed the, the, the slide I wanted to have, namely uh, in physics, we're very good at, at developing theories. Actually, we have very successful theories of the very small. And if you think about the 20th century, I think it was a reductionist way of thinking that brought us very far namely we want to understand the world and many people thought that we have finally understood all the things about elementary particles and also the theory of general relativity which is so successful i think this is a reductionist way of thinking but there's a uh, other view that we should then maybe have which puts itself also in in the middle of this because all of this have been derived from our way in which we deduce information or we, we get theories out of absorbing information like in the universe we generally are very good at understanding what is happening at very large scales and also at very small scales physicists tend to avoid most of the things that are happening at human scales and maybe because that's even more complex and i think there's a reason for that if you look at our theories usually uh, the theories of the very small are very beautiful and simple and actually also the models that we make of our cosmos are generally quite simple but described with very few parameters while the actual world around us is much more complex. And so what I think we're doing when we are looking at nature is really, uh, I actually took this picture from uh, the cover of uh, Roger Penrose's book, 
is really make a model of the world. We have the physical world, which we're observing. Then in our brain, we eventually develop a model, which is then sort of our platonic world where these equations that we derive are living. And this is where I also think the link with information comes from, because in our process of observing the physical world, we are actually reducing uh, the, the, the model into some abstraction. I mean, the physical world is complex. It has many things going on, but our models of nature are abstract and they uh, amount to a reduction of information. And as I'll make clear, actually information and, and uh, so what I mean by information, by the way, is not just what we call information, which is useful to us. It's also the, the information you would need to really describe what's all going on in this whole complex world around us. Because what we're doing in our brain is actually forgetting a lot of information. And this is sort of why notions like entropy actually come into the game, because entropy is a way of keeping track of how much information we have forgotten. So I think information and inf emergence are, are very much related. And this is also my point of view of how nature works, that eventually uh, we're reducing, uh, well, what we're observing at least is a reduced form of the information that is actually there. And so this is how I define emergence is that, that we indeed observe phenomena which at the macroscopic scale are derived from something at the microscopic scale where it has no a priori meaning. Uh, for instance, in this picture, there are pixels, but when we look at larger scales, we see mountains, trees, and so on. And in a certain way, you should think about this as uh, emergence uh, concepts. So my view of the world is like this. We live in a world uh, full of information and we somehow, uh, our brains must sort of make this into our physical laws. And this is also what happens in gravity. So in gravity, we have discovered that entropy plays in a very important role. And you may wonder why that is the case. So what is entropy? It's, it's a notion that is uh, introduced in thermodynamics to basically describe what is the amount of information required to describe the micro microscopic state say of all the, the molecules of a gas. And you can basically think about entropy as indeed the number of bits that is required to describe this. And then there are derived emergent notions like temperature and so on that are, are basically derived from statistical mechanics. They, they describe the average energy per microscopic particles. And actually entropy plays an important role because it actually can lead to forces. So this is something that I thought uh, to my students when I was teaching uh, statistical physics is that there are forces in nature that are purely thermodynamic in origin. And one of the famous examples is that of a polymer uh, where you have a polymer that, that curls up. In itself, the polymer has no uh, ability to create a force, but when you put it in a heat bath, simply because it wants to occupy the most entropic state, it wants to shorten. And then if you have a, a bead attached to it, which you pull, you actually can measure a, a elastic force. And that force is known to be entropic in the sense that its magnitude is determined by the temperature. If there's no temperature, actually this elasticity would go away. Sometimes it's misunderstood that entropic forces have to do with changes in entropy, which is not actually the case. I mean, the, the, the force is actually needed in order to make sure that things happen adiabatically. And we know indeed that an elastic force is um, reversible. Actually, it's uh, described by a potential uh, that indeed means that there is no actual change of entropy, but just the fact that there is an entropy playing an, an underlying role actually can, can be used to derive this uh, force. And the reason I'm telling you this is that because I want to apply the same uh, principle to gravity. And of course, in gravity, we know that we also have a conservative force where, where if you describe it in Newtonian way, you would have a potential and so on. So this idea was sort of in my mind when I was thinking about why does gravity have something to do with information or with, with entropy. Of course, that came from all the work that Bekenstein, Hawking, and, and actually Penrose played an important role in this as well, um, in deriving uh, what we now call the black laws of black hole thermodynamics. That is namely the observation that the horizon area plays the role of an entropy in the, in the way that if we would write down the gravitational equations of how black holes behave when, for instance, you merge or you throw other things into the black hole, the horizon always increases. And you can even prove this, uh, which was uh, the, the 
area theorem by Hawking, and but then the actual formulation became that of a set of laws that looks exactly like the laws of thermodynamics, which we know we can derive uh, from statistical physics. So this is one thing, but then also the question is why is gravity so special that somehow it knows about this microscopic, well, about this entropy or something like that. And this is where indeed, uh, well, this idea of emergent gravity, first of all, comes around. Uh, so what is emergent gravity? So the, the fact that we can derive um, statistical physics from, so I, I should say, uh, thermodynamics from statistical physics is actually the fact that we can derive in particular the first law, which tells you that when you change the energy, there's also an associated change in entropy uh, and the proportionality constant is given by the temperature. This you can also apply to black holes. And in that case, the entropy as already told you is the area of a horizon. And the temperature has to do with the acceleration, the gravitational acceleration at the location of the horizon. And then you can write down the same law where the change in energy becomes the change in the mass and the change in entropy uh, then translates to the change in area. And this law actually is equivalent in some form to the gravitational laws. Now, the idea of the emergent gravity is that there should be a microscopic explanation of these equations Simple, in the same way that we know that we can describe uh, the microscopic origin of thermodynamics. Um, the other thing that I, I focused on in, in a paper I wrote a long time ago, which was called on this entropic gravity idea. By the way, I think the, the name entropic gravity is perhaps even better still than emergent gravity because emergence is a very general notion. And Tropic makes clear that what it emerges from is really the entropy of some, some microscopic system. And by now we actually know that this entropy should be thought of as, as sort of an entanglement entropy uh, in the, in the, in the uh, structure of uh, quantum structure of space time. The other thing we have to understand is not just the gravitational laws, which are like Newton's law or, or um, the Einstein equations, I mean, those are laws that we generally associate with gravity, but there's another force aspect of gravity, which is just inertia. The fact that the mass determines the force by if we want to accelerate uh, is something that we need to be explaining as well, because when we are really thinking about explaining uh, what gravity comes from or what even the space-time geometry comes from, then the first thing you want to know is why do objects move in the way they do? And why does it uh, require a force when we start accelerating an object? And so this is a, a thought experiment that you can do. And one thing that, that I learned is that you can actually apply the same reasoning as you, I, I did for this polymer idea, namely that there is actually an origin of uh, this inertial force, which has to do with the fact that there's a temperature. I mean, I told you that a force, um, well, first of all, in, in Newton's law, a force requires an acceleration. I mean, that's what Newton's laws tell you. But also what we learned is that there's a, a, a temperature required to get a force if it's an entropic force. And indeed, the temperature is proportional to this acceleration. So one thing that you find is that you can naturally explain why the force is proportional to the acceleration. If you start from this microscopic point of view that I first explained the temperature, and then you can derive the origin of the force. Actually, in the talk that follows by Manus Fischer, he will uh, continue in this theme about why, what is really a microscopic way or, or, or well, a way of thinking about uh, this origin of uh, inertia. It's a question that also uh, Lenny Susskind has been thinking about. I mean, there are many papers have been appearing actually since the original paper that I have written uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, for instance, well, Lenny has a paper which called Why Do Things Fall? And indeed thinking about sort of more this question, I mean, his idea is also that the actual origin of the force has to do, or why the things fall, has to do with a microscopic uh, process that, that requires this information that is contained in the space time. So this is uh, indeed the, the recent developments that have been going on are all centered around the interpretation of this beckenstein hawking formula, not just for black holes, also uh, these horizons appear when you accelerate uh, and they appear in, in any part of space-time that even look like the vacuum. 
And the current interpretation is that this formula actually explains the entang or, or describes the entanglement entropy between two sides of space time. When I have a horizon, the horizon can be thought of as sort of a surface that is created. Then if you accelerate one direction, you, you create a horizon somewhere in space, and then you basically split the space into two parts. And entanglement is then a property that tells you that the quantum states on one side sort of are connected to the, the quantum uh, states on the other side. And this is even what sort of leads to the ideas of connectivity. And uh, the formula that described it, and is something that has been verified very explicitly in, in certain models, is that indeed the entanglement entropy is equal to the area of a certain surface that we put into space. And this is called now also the Ryu Kokaniagi formula that has been derived, as I said, even in some microscopic models. Um, and indeed, in these same models, people have derived the Einstein's equations using this first law. And actually, this whole program of emergent gravity basically has been completed in a, a setting where the space time, well, unfortunately, has no cosmological constant. It actually has a negative curvature. It's called ADS space. And in that space, people have exactly done what I said before, namely derived the Einstein's equations from this first law. Uh, of basically entanglement entropy. So there's a way that the entanglement entropy is the origin of this force. As I mentioned, this is in a uh, toy example of a universe, a toy universe, which you call anti sitter space, has no cosmological uh, horizon or no uh, expansion. It's a negatively curved space. It has a boundary even. And there's an additional sort of emergent direction in this space, which we call the scale of the theory, because the microscopic theory lives actually on the boundary and the gravity emerges in the, this story. So this is a very well understood model or actually theoretical description, I should say, of uh, a theory of emergent uh, gravity, where many of these ideas have been tested and actually have been developed. But the thing that I want to do in the next part is actually uh, indeed take these lessons that we learned in this anti dissider space and go to a more physical universe that has uh, a dark energy in it. And then we want to, of course, see then what happens with these um, uh, same ideas about the emergence of gravity. I briefly want to mention one fact about this, namely for ADS CFT, we have indeed understood not just that there is a relationship between this uh, area entanglement and uh, entanglement, sorry, uh, entropy and entanglement. But there's also really an explanation of what is really the number of states that a black hole has, because this entropy also counts basically, uh, well, the, the set of possible quantum states, the information that's required to describe the state of a black hole. And it turns out in this case, you need some thermal system uh, on the microscopic scale uh, which is very different from just ordinary particles. It has some long strings, it's called, in them. And that picture, I think, uh, is something we have to take over and maybe even apply in these other uh, contexts if we want to go to the sitter space. I'm not the only one working on this. This is a, a poster of a meeting that just took place uh, two weeks ago in, uh, in uh, New York. Uh, this is the World Science Festival. And here it's Einstein and the quantum entanglement and emergence. And it's precisely about this topic. How do we get gravity out of entanglement? And there the speakers were um, also Lenny Suskind and uh, Mark van Ramstonk, who's actually one of the key people who realized that the importance of quantum entanglement in this sort of gluing space time from say the two parts of uh, the horizon. And indeed this whole idea that uh, gravity emerges is something that by now I think in our, my community has been accepted and I think that theory is going to be developed but it's not something that we fully understand and certainly not in the context yet of a, a, a space time with a positive energy a dark energy so anyway this, these are some popular uh, discussions about all of these ideas I'll briefly mention this uh, information paradox. Again, the word information appears here because this is one of the main focus uh, of the discussions in the recent years, uh, namely how do we, uh, can we retrieve information and uh, from 
a black hole if we throw something in how can we decode it from the radiation that comes from the black hole the reason i'm mentioning it is because this is really a model a theoretical framework a laboratory laboratory where we can develop ideas of mount emergent gravity and even emergence of space time because we want to understand in this case how do we describe indeed the reality of both the thing that falls into the black hole as well as things that come into the radiation and we're learning a lot of things that we can eventually apply to other situations with horizons like uh, in our cosmos so let me then get indeed to the emergent gravity in the sitter space and here i have to uh, want to tell you a little bit more about well first of all the ideas that i developed here uh, i'm going to get eventually to this fourth part about the cosmological evolution but first, I want to remind you a little bit about what were the essential ingredients and in thinking about emergent gravity in the sitter space. So the difference with uh, the sitter space and, and anti the sitter space is that the sitter space does have a horizon. The metric looks very similar, but it has very important consequences. There is uh, just a change of sign that you have here. Uh, so uh, anti the sitter space had this uh, boundary, but the sitter space has no boundary. It's more like hyperboloid. And if you are living in one part of this the sitter space, you can only see a, a part of it. And if you want to interact with things in your, your expanding or in your universe, you actually are only seeing something we call a causal diamond. It's something that uh, basically is bounded by horizons and we are living inside of it in the middle and we can only communicate with certain things that have the time for things sort of like to travel to it and then also come back to us where ideally we imagine here we live sort of in an infinite time because this is not a big bang scenario it's really a static universe if you think about it from well without any matter it's it's simply a, a universe where we can live uh, an infinite amount of time and it would describe quite accurately a universe with dark energy if there would only be dark energy. So if we would wait long enough in our universe and dark energy becomes really dominant, it would be described by the sitter space. But currently we have a universe that has uh, other components as well. Uh, but since my central theme um, in this presentation is not just, well, what is the energy content? I'm more interested actually in what is the entropy content and one thing that I'm, I'm going to be quick in, in telling you is that the entropy that I'm interested in is not the one that we associate with particles or things like that, but it should, it's again the one that we should associate with a horizon, namely the cosmological horizon. And then you come to the conclusion that most of the entropy actually in the universe is sitting in something that we have no access to. It's uh, an entropy that is characterized by the size of the horizon, but we are only dealing with the particles that we can observe the light that we see a certain part of the the universe that we can access but most of the information is hidden in uh, something else and i'm indeed going to claim that this something else is actually the dark energy that i've added to the universe and then you estimate this number well it's something that I think Charles told me once that it must should be one to the one twenty three or something like that. It's a big, much bigger number than than anything that we have in our entire universe. Even if we count all the black holes and so on, we will not, never get to this number. This number is really information in the universe that we cannot observe, and therefore it's really an entropy. But it does play a role because I already told you if you have some entropy in your system and you don't know about it, one way to find out is to look for forces. But actually entropy can create forces they can be entropic forces and this is indeed the, the idea that that i developed at the moment when i was developing a theory of, of emergence of entropic gravity is that when i thought about the cosmos i had the image that our cosmos had much more information than we could actually access and entropy i knew could give rise to forces they can give rise to the gravitational force but maybe to other forces as well because this entropy is not something that is there simply well in here uh, well uh, associated to to the horizon itself actually it's an entropy that is associated to the dark energy and actually it's an entropy that we can um well even locally can have uh, measure its its consequences of so what what how did i get to this number i mean there is in the cosmological setting also a horizon 
uh, it's given by the the well the Hubble radius basically if you have a constant Hubble constant then then the horizon is exactly given by c over h naught and you can calculate the area of that horizon and th th that number is, is what I told you about if this would be the present day Hubble constant there's also a temperature actually one way to think about it is, is also as measured in the Hubble constant but another way is even to write it again as an acceleration uh, because if you multiply the Hubble constant by C it's an acceleration scale that so, sort of is, is associated with with the cosmological universe and that's this acceleration scale which I call a zero and then you can indeed think about uh, the temperature of the Decida scale space again as something proportional to an acceleration just as the same as we did for black holes this by the way is this causal patch which I uh, told you about it's also something called the static coordinate patch and this uh, is indeed the, the way i wrote already the sitter space notice this minus sign and this is where this horizon comes from because that's where, where you read off in the, in this uh, metric and so our observable universe looks kind of like a diamond where we live in the middle and uh, we have a horizon around it with a temperature and so then you may ask well what is necessary to describe this and i'm claiming indeed it's a state with a lot of entropy. I'm not the only one claiming this. Um, I actually, one reason I missed the first day of the cloak of this uh, meeting is why I was actually in Paris for a meeting. Uh, but there was also a presentation by Ed Witten. Actually, there's a paper out yesterday. I'm just showing you a little bit. It's actually about the sitter space and it has also to do with entropy. And so they look at the static patch in the sitter space. And here is claim. The sitter space, which is just the empty state, the sitter space is a maximum entropy state. And so when you add things to it, actually, you lower the entropy. This is something that now already other people are talking about. It's something that I emphasized and actually is part of my description of what uh, the sitter space should be. And indeed, when you add this idea of adding matter to the sitter space, you can actually calculate this using just the, the GR equations because when you do this, you're actually indeed reducing the area of the cosmological horizon. This function in front of dt squared actually is modified when you add matter and you find that there's a change in the entropy, which is negative. And you can write it actually as the energy that you added divided by the temperature. So it's like a first law, but then with a minus sign. Now, the thing that I uh, find striking and it's sort of what led me to think that there may be other ways to think about gravity in the sitter space is that the same scales this energy divided by the temperature and an area feature in and looking at just empirically at galaxies so what is this equation in this context when this ratio where m is the mass inside a certain uh, region of space divided by this temperature of the sitter space is smaller than the area of a sphere that's containing this mass, you actually see DR, this is where the deviations in, in the gravitational force are happening. That's an empirical fact. This is another empirical fact is this is where we usually test uh, general relativity. Dark matter sort of appears when the acceleration scale becomes lower than an acceleration scale associated with the Hubble constant. And this is another scale, namely, uh, so here actually we have not, not just the, the acceleration actually is in this direction. The, um, no, this is the potential, sorry. This is the potential, this is the curvature. The, the acceleration is actually a product of these two. And since this is a logarithmic, this is why this is a, a straight line. Anyway, this is where you get dark energies below a certain uh, curvature scale. And I claim that this is the regime where things might start differing. This is where emergent gravity, at least the way I'm thinking about it, might have consequences and, and do things differently than in the, in the GR regime. And I already mentioned pictures that I had in mind when I was thinking about this. I thought indeed that what we are looking at is simply, well, we only see the matter, we see some forces, but we have no idea what really is going on entirely in this whole universe because there's stuff going on that has to do with information that we don't access. And I basically had pictures of this in my head, but that where we indeed have to think about what's really necessary to describe all of this. And this is what we're being, what is currently being developed. The other thing I realized indeed is that there's a lot of um, 
theories that we have derived and actually uh, which are successful in describing lots of phenomena in, in nature, but in a very short time compared to the age of the universe. Our observation time is very short. Of course, we're looking back. And so we can try to use our models uh, to derive a lot of, well, things, or at least conclude a lot of things about our past. But still, you have to understand that, that we have been only there for a very short time. If indeed the age of the universe would be one year, we are only there to observe it for a fraction of a second. This was another image I had. Quickly, where's the galaxy? It's the middle, yeah, but the pictures are very similar. I claim the physics is kind of similar, same. This is, of course, anyway, this is a tornado. This is just a whirlpool. But I think, I think there's something missing here because we know here there's lots of things happening around it that are basically pulling these things. And maybe there's something, something there as well. The other picture I had is really did that, that we have a universe filled with information and really these galaxies are, are in a sea of information and there might be effects going on there. Finally, there's this observation, which I think is quite important. I think that the, the vacuum in the sitter space is not empty. Well, first of all, there's dark energy, but there's also entropy sitting there. And the analogy you should have is with a crystal uh, or glass because the crystal does not really have entropy. It has a unique ground state. It has unique configuration, but a glass has very similar properties, but the difference is, is that it has lots of entropy in it. That's a pity. Uh, that's only five minutes because I had something to say about the other stuff. Anyway, uh, maybe I should. Um, yeah, actually. Actually, maybe I should. Well, I don't know. Yeah, anyway, what I wanted to do continue is actually this idea of that indeed there is a, a, an entropy in the state and that that actually does affect the, um, the gravitational laws. And I actually made a model actually very similar to this polymer idea. I sometimes show this, that you have uh, this silly putty that when you measure it at short time scales, it, it's bouncing, it has elasticity, but at long time scales, it actually flows very much like a glass. And the physics of it actually was solved by the gen using equations that I could use actually. And actually there's an equation that I want to show here actually has some models with these polymers. And it's this equation that eventually played a role. So I'm claiming the fact that there is an entropy in our universe actually makes, uh, causes an additional force that is due to the uh, dark energy and it behaves sort of like an elastic force. And the thing that, that made me sort of believe this is the following fact that there is a very nice way that elasticity and uh, gravity can be mapped onto each other, precisely using an acceleration scale. All of the quantities that we know from gravity are related to uh, associated quantities in elasticity by simply putting in one scale. Then you can take the equation that was derived here and rewrite it in some other form namely using these equations. And out comes an equation, which I put here. Actually, I have to assume a certain volume here, which is sort of uh, has to be put in. But anyway, this equation can be derived using the same math that we can use on polymers. And it actually is an equation that explains this behavior. Basically, it gives you a, a month life uh, scaling or what's nowadays called this radial acceleration relation. And the, the equations uh, indeed can be tested, and this is precisely what Maho has been doing, uh, by not just comparing with rotation curves, but also uh, with uh, electro, sorry, with uh, weak lensing uh, data. And this is what actually is important here is that uh, you're not just testing it in very short uh, distances with slow acceler, well, with a, a certain acceleration, small, but not so small. You can even go further and a longer distance and even weaker uh, acceleration. And you still have this same relation extended over these many uh, decades. I wanna finish actually with this other part, uh, which I'm gonna be brief about. Actually, we heard the talk 
by Nikki this, this morning about the Hubble tension. And actually maybe this is where I want to get to. Because one thing that you can actually get is from this uh, whole idea of uh, emergent gravity, something that I call an effective dark matter density. So the equation that I showed you can be rewritten in a form where the dark matter density is related to the baryonic matter and the full critical density. And uh, it depends also on the scale that you look at this, because this you can indeed put also in the in scales of, of uh, clusters and so on, or galaxies. But you can also take R to be the radius of the universe. And in that case, you actually get a prediction for the dark matter abundance. And actually this formula comes out, which is something I put here. And this is sort of where it would lie with the data. So it's something that, that agrees with C and B values very well. Uh, but now I want to get indeed to the final thing, which is sort of this cosmological evolution. And here I just want to show a little bit the plots and the model that I put in. But there's a disclaimer. I mean, uh, I think uh, if we really want to discuss this very seriously, I should develop the theory of emergent gravity much further. We should have some way of deriving dynamics and having some analog of the Friedman equation or something that at least we can derive from this microscopic picture. What I've done here is a very simple thing. I basically took my um, phenomenological relation and put it in the Friedman equation and see simply what is the consequence. Why I'm interested in this, of course, I want to see if maybe this idea might help us uh, understanding something about uh, the tensions that we are being observed. Because it's another model on lambda CDM. It's not a model that would change uh, dark energy, like, like was explained this morning. It would be a different equation of state or a different evolution of the dark matter component. So that's the basic idea. So I want to briefly show you what is the outcome. Um, so this is the, the, the Friedman equation with all of the components in there. Now, normally we start playing a little bit with this, but we always assume that dark matter is doing what it's usually doing. And our model, we, we do something different. Namely, we say that all of these terms are there, but I'm going to think about a dark matter as this effective dark matter component that has a relationship between the full matter and matter actually for me, matter is anything that's a particle. It also includes radiation. So there is a way that I'm going to write this equation in, so that the relationship actually is between the dark matter density and this combination of the, the baryonic and radiation density. So I'm going to put this in this equation and then see what the evolution is doing. And you find some plots that indeed the dark matter actually in the radiation dominated area actually becomes, well, growing actually. But then there is um, something nowadays that we can fit quite well with what is being observed. But in the intermediate time, actually, it turns out that the dark matter density is much smaller than what we would get from lambda CDM. But you can ask, is this in, uh, in agreement or in disagreement with observations? Because the observations are generally only, uh, actually, there's something not showing on the slide. I had a gray band here. Do you see something gray here? Because I see it on the slide here. Anyway, there's some here because the redshift 1000 has sort of been selected here because that's something where we should verify the CMB. So the fact that we get something of the order of one there is quite important because that makes this uh, consistent with, uh, with CMB data. Same is true for Hubble. I mean, we find, I mean, of course I try to play in such a way I mean, I don't think I, I fitted that many parameters there. Of course, it's a bit of a um, thing involved to get at least the same data that we have at short and, and long distances, but it's possible to have a higher uh, H zero now and something in the radiation or whatever in, in the CMB area where, where we get a, a reasonable fit with the, the CMB. So these are things I would like to uh, indeed test also as well. And, and exactly what was explained this morning, I also verified that things like the sound horizon and the angle that we see there basically works out. And I use the standard equations for those. And this is where I want to just end to show you a little bit of those, those plots. Um, so this is the co-moving distance evolution. So this is what I basically, how I define it. So there's an H of Z, you integrate it, and then you can see what that does in these two models. So I'm comparing Lambda CDM to the model that I have. You see some deviation, actually quite a high one here. 
And um, there's also things like the sound horizon that's doing things like that. But the actual variable I'm interested in is this angle because this angle is the one that we want to compare to the observations. And again, there should be a gray band here, which tells you that, well, this, the, the, the CMB is being decoupled around here. And that's indeed where we find that, that our model has at least agreement with what is being observed and also what would be following from Lambda CDM. So I wanna stop here because this is, um, well, as I said, some, some a bit of a speculation um, because I didn't fully develop the entire theory yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? I see two, one on the front row or well, the- Yeah, yeah the Eric, could you put on your like your third or fourth slide where you showed the polymer being heated up and then you talked about, um, well, my question is about the difference between the relationship between gravity on one side and entropy and the change in entropy. It seems to me that there are two different things and your polymer example was a really good example of how a change in entropy, delta S, has a force, but the S by, see, see you, you can only make that force when you have a delta S going on, but once that polymer, the entropy is no longer changing, then there's no longer a force. It's kind of like the Gibbs free energy has an entropy in it, and that describes the thermal equilibrium, but it's not a force. You have to be changing the entropy in order to extract a force from that equation. So that's my confusion. I, I, I spent some time explaining that confusion here. The actual equation here is that um, when you lower this speed, you're doing it adiabatically. Because if that would not have been the force, the entropy would have changed. So the force is actually making sure that the entropy does not change. But the consequence of the force is the tendency to change the entropy. So th this is a, a reversible system. So when you're lowering it, you're actually extracting uh, heat from the heat path. Yes, yes, I, I, and that I, amount is the same as the amount of entropy that's increased in the polymer configuration because the polymer configuration uh, contains more entropy when it's short, but the heat path will take it out. And that is actually the work that you can do. Well, that, with part I understand. that part I understand. I don't understand what it has to do with entropy itself. This is the change in entropy. Why would there be a force associated with entropy? Oh, sorry. Uh, it's indeed if the entropy itself would not be a force, it's if there would be an effect that changes it, yes. then there would be a force. Yes. But it means that you're moving things around I mean, from one side to the other. But uh, you're right. But that's the same is true for gravity. Well, the, but, the, but the rest of your talk talks about not delta S DSDT, but rather S and gravity, not DSDT. No, 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 no. I, I, do, I, I have always the, the equations here where there is a D here acting. That is actually the, the, the change. Okay. So if you want to derive Einstein's equations, you have to take the effect of the change in the curvature of change in the area when you add matter. So this is what actually one way to think about GR, by the way, is indeed if a mass is there, why is there curvature? Actually, if you take the mass of a, a volume of space, so the area of a certain volume of space, that area changes when you put a mass inside. And that's one way to think about curvature. Okay, if you have time, we'll just do one more question. Right, thanks. That's really fascinating to learn. And towards the end, Eric, you showed the um, uh, the expected uh, expansion history of the universe like, predicted from this uh, theory, and also the matter uh, ratio. And it seems that in, between the CMB and the current stage, uh, they are roughly about the same as we would expect, but in between there's a fairly dramatic difference. That's correct. And I wonder if we, you would expect a, a, a rather different uh, integrated saxo wolf effect through um, those drastic changes. Well, these are exactly the kind of things. So the question is, what are our, our observations that constrain the time evolution between those? Sides? And you have to, of course, understand for which redshifts this is relevant. And uh, I think I have it in the plot. Maybe I should show you, but then uh, I have to go through all these slides again. Let me maybe do this quickly. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, the baryonic acoustic oscillations, as we heard this morning, is also important constraints, which I haven't fully digested yet. 
but there are consequences. So this is, I think, the, the one you mean, mean or yeah. this one here. Um, and there are consequences here, of course. I mean, one, re one thing that I find at least um, assuring, I mean, is that, that I think this also tells you that there should be less structure formed in the time because of the, the so the sigma eight might actually be consistent with this, but there are all kinds of effects that might have, uh, well, be associated with it. But of course, there, there are other things in, in this model as well. There's still dark energy and there's still the ordinary matter that you have to take into account anyway, but this is just the dark matter component. And as you see here, the redshift is already 10. It's not something that is immediately uh, measured. I mean, there's, uh, the, this region might be interesting to check. So this is why I'm quite interested in, in how they can uh, see the equation of state of changing or the evolution of the universe at redshift of two or three, because then you can see these turnarounds quite uh, well, maybe better. Okay, thank you. Um, Eric will probably also be available for uh, questions during the lunch, so we should uh, thank him.